Good afternoon, and thank you all uh, for coming to today's session, Preparing Instructors to Teach Responsible Use of AI Tools, a Cross-Campus Approach. Please mute yourselves if you haven't already, and please put questions in the chat um, preceded by the letter Q so that we can pull them out from comments. Um, and let me turn this over now to our esteemed presenters, Mona Thompson and Benjamin Shaw. Thank you. Thanks so much, Wendy, and thanks everybody. We are excited to be here. Um, we are coming to you from University of Maryland College Park and two different offices, which we'll talk about within there. So I'm Mona Thompson. I'm a senior education development specialist at our Teaching and Learning Transformation Center. And I'm Benjamin Shaw. I'm one of the teaching and learning librarians at McKeldin Library here. Um, and so to start off with some kind of framing for this project we'll talk to you about today. Uh, you'll notice that Ben and I are coming at you from two different offices on campus, and we came into this project that we'll share with you with two different goals based on our positions at the university. So I work in the Teaching and Learning Transformation Center, where really ever since ChatGPT blew up, I was focused on supporting instructors to teach effectively in an AI permeated world. So that was doing things like workshops and consultations that some of you here might be doing as well in your own institutions. Um, one thing that was coming up a lot in my work, especially in those really early days, but still a lot now, is how could I, for my position on campus, support instructors who are not themselves experts in AI to be able to effectively teach their students about AI? As you all know, instructors have a million different things uh, that are kind of taking up their time. And so I was trying to think of like, how could I help them so they did not have to also spend their time becoming an expert in something that they might not know about either. Across campus, in Ben's role as a teaching and learning librarian, he was really focused on how to directly foster students' information literacy about these new AI tools. So in his role previously, he'd been spending a lot of time kind of working with getting students to think critically about like sources and context and where does information come from. Uh, and so he was thinking a lot about like, what does that look like for students in this really rapidly changing new landscape? So we got randomly connected in spring semester of 2023, and both of us were curious about the other one's perspective on AI um, and how it was affecting their role. So here's what we finally converged on and what we'll be talking about today. This is something we created over the summer of 2023, and it's live. And we created a Canvas module on AI and information literacy that can be integrated into any course on campus. So you can see how this project was kind of both getting at Ben's direct interest in increasing students' information literacy around AI tools, as well as me wanting to be able to offer a service to instructors to just put into their classes so that they could effectively teach on these topics. So uh, here's a little bit more about the project before we dive into the details. These were the overall goals. So we were really interested in addressing information literacy gaps. We wanted to take some of those early days conversations about plagiarism especially and really focus more on kind of how do we create informed users of new technology as so many of you have already been talking about today. We were really intentional. We wanted to reach a broad variety of students and we didn't want to alienate students who were going to have a broad variety of reactions and opinions about AI themselves. We wanted something that was easy to integrate into courses and widely applicable. So to undergraduates and graduates and to students in all different disciplines. And we were interested in practical school skills, not bound by any particular AI tool and to try to keep it as evergreen as possible, which we'll talk through a little bit more. Our methodology of kind of how we created this module, there were a few different things we did. So we spent a lot of time just discussing with each other the conversations that we'd been having with faculty and students, the questions we that have been coming up a lot uh, that people had been asking us, as well as just like what we'd done ourselves to experiment with generative AI. We worked from a lot of existing resources and information literacy concepts. We built on a lot of excellent work that was already out there. One of the things that was most fun about this project was we collaborated directly with AI researchers at University of Maryland College Park. Uh, so instead of people only hearing from us in the module, we made sure that they were hearing from people who actually studied AI uh, in some of these explanations. And we focused really specifically, as you know, it's a humongous topic. So we tried to kind of keep the bounds being really about AI and information literacy and in the context of university assignments and research. 
as you all know, it's such a fast changing landscape. So it's really tricky to design something uh, that like we just really didn't want to update it all the time, even though we're obviously updating it some. So here are a couple things that we really focused on in order to kind of make it more robust over time. We focused on cognitive rather than mechanical skills. So uh, kind of student critical reading concepts of lateral reading, which we'll talk about a little more and critical thinking rather than saying kind of, here's how specifically you use this one tool or something. Cause we didn't even know what Maryland's institutional contracts were gonna look like for different tools in the future. Um, and we wanted to keep, especially the videos that we were creating and harder to update content focused really on general themes about AI and not specifically named tools. And a couple of those we even made flexible so they could be uh, pivoted to, uh, to work for instructors too, as well as directly to students. Now I'll turn it over to Ben, who's going to talk about what actually was in this module. Thanks so much, Mona. So with all of those conversations and all of those considerations, we landed on a module with four separate sections. Uh, the first was some basics on how AI works. So that includes both examples of AI tools and what they can do, some of the basic mechanics of how generative AI comes up with responses or images, um, but also issues of bias, labor, and privacy, which we also thought were some of the basic building blocks of uh, some of these considerations about how these tools actually work. Um, next, we had a module on how to assess content. So uh, this is a fact checking section, thinking about pointing out common errors made by text-based AI in particular, um, and looking at some of those lateral reading exercises that we mentioned. Uh, we had been getting a lot of questions about how and whether to cite AI uh, in academic assignments. So we had a page on citing correctly. And then we had uh, what we termed a level up page, which were resources to explore further. Um, so tools, uh, the Dolly prompt book, suggestions for ways you could use this. Uh, and I'm gonna dive a little bit more into each of these sections. Um, so our first section, uh, again, we had these overview of basic terms and mechanics, uh, what all the letters in GPT stood for, uh, how AI tools go about generating a response. And this is where uh, we pulled in some of these videos from our partners uh, over at the Department of Computer Science and some of these AI experts as well. Um, and also explaining uh, issues of AI bias and uh, labor, some of these uh, what might be termed ethical issues. Um, so we included that in a section called using AI carefully and thoughtfully. So this section included both issues of accuracy and security and also labor and bias. So we didn't want a, a page that was easy to skip over called ethics. Uh, so we didn't really think that's a compartmentalizable part of the conversation. These are important ideas for everyone to engage in. Um, and then at the end, we have a quiz uh, where students uh, can check their work. It can be used as an instructor assignment if uh, people like, uh, but it can also be used to reinforce some of these concepts. So in the assessing content section, we had, uh, again, two broad sections. Uh, the first going over examples of ways AI can get things wrong um, in case students were not aware. So for instance, uh, we have these categories uh, where we pulled examples from a variety of text-based AI tools, generating wrong or misleading information, leaving out information, inventing false information, uh, producing uh, sources that were either inaccurate or irrelevant, um, and then interpreting prompts in unexpected ways. Um, so uh, for instance, when uh, we asked ChatGPT to generate uh, a text based on uh, how elephants are affiliated with University of Maryland student culture, um, it referenced our actual mascot, which is a diamondback terrapin, uh, but then invented things about elephants being part of our sports traditions uh, because it was interpreting that prompt as taking it as a given that elephants are involved in UMD sports culture. Please uh, produce this prompt. Um, so we kind of point out some of these more obvious examples to get students to think about how uh, this is showing up in ways that aren't as obvious. Um, and so then we move on to some of these more practical toolkits on how students can actually tackle a fact check like this. So uh, lateral reading uh, is a fact checking technique that's uh, been widely used in online source evaluation. So uh, we wanted to apply that concept to evaluating AI generated content. So it encourages readers to look outside a piece of writing for markers of credibility rather than just inside. Um, and that's pretty useful, uh, again, when we're dealing with an AI generated text. We encourage people to look at trusted human generated sources to verify this information. And then uh, we wanted to go beyond just checking if individual facts were true, but encouraging people to think of AI as not 
something without a viewpoint. Uh, uh, it is scraping this huge corpus of text. So uh, all of those texts have a viewpoint um, and these kind of biases uh, and omissions uh, show up in these responses. So uh, we had a couple of those uh, show up in some of our example responses. For instance, when we prompted, uh, give us a history of 16th century art, uh, the machines only uh, used European art uh, unless prompted otherwise. And we noticed that this was true actually in non-European languages as well. Um, so we give, again, some of these obvious situations to get folks to think about how they show up elsewhere. And then we give them uh, some kind of concrete steps. So we have this AI fact-checking uh, sheet right here, uh, giving them some suggestions on this. From there, we move uh, to a video where we demonstrate a full AI fact check in action, and then a quiz uh, where we give a full AI prompt and then a questionnaire afterwards. So some of this information is true and some of it is false. So we challenge students uh, to do their own research and find out what the correct answers are. Um, for our citation uh, list, again, we wanted to say why we cite and why and how to cite AI. And then we were able to link to some of APA and MLA's own pages uh, because these are dynamic, uh, somewhat uh, changing. So uh, we wanted to make sure that they were there in case of updates. Uh, and then lastly, for students who were interested, um, we didn't want to include too much uh, AI image generation, for instance, uh, because we wanted to uh, make this accessible to both students who were skeptical or hostile towards AI but also uh, students who were enthusiastic about AI because this is information that everybody needs. So if there were students who wanted to explore more, uh, they were able to do so uh, through linking out to these external resources. Um, and again, these resources to explore as part of the AI conversation, like news articles uh, and prompt writing tips. So um, we are very fortunate to uh, have had a, a positive reception for the module. So far, we have 180 courses on the University of Maryland College Park campus that have imported the module, and 25 other institutions are using the module at the moment, um, including uh, universities internationally. Um, we also have a companion libguide that we created on the library website, just so uh, students whose instructors did not choose to integrate this content into their uh, online course space could still access it. Um, so that has most of the content, just not the quizzes. Um, we've also had some uh, positive testimony from faculty and students. So next, we're going to survey uh, instructors on their experiences with the module uh, more explicitly and intentionally. Um, and Mona has put in the chat, uh, there is a full link to explore the module there. Um, this summer, we're also going to be updating the module with new information, up-to-date information about uh, changes in AI and some new skills. Um, so we want to give, uh, again, a special thanks to our co-author, Dario Yako, who could not be here today. Um, she's the library's coordinator for, coordinator for AI teaching and learning. Um, and also to Hal DeMay III and Katie Shilton and all the folks at the Institute for Trustworthy AI in Law and Society. Uh, so again, uh, we have uh, the link in the chat. Um, feel free to contact us with questions, um, but also we're happy to take questions right now. Yeah, and I can go ahead and answer the first question, which is like a logistical one about uh, accessing the module um, and then keep putting them in the chat too as we talk about that. So the link that we put in um, has different ways to access the module. How we've shared it since our primary audience was folks at University of Maryland College Park is we share it internally using Canvas Commons uh, because of factors out of our control. Uh, that's only an internal instance of Canvas Commons, but if you're at an institution that uses Canvas, which I know a lot of people are, are using different things, but if you're an institution that uses Canvas, that link that we shared at the very bottom, there's a link to a form you can fill out and we're happy to share an import package with you. Um, and we'll just email that your way. We've done that with a lot of other folks. If you don't use Canvas, that won't work because it's designed in Canvas, but there's a view only link on that page or the library guide is a really great one as well that you can view all the content and it's all just Creative Commons license. So we love it when other people use it uh, as long as you just give the proper credit.
So faculty are uh, not actually required to use the module. So this was a, a voluntary resource uh, that we started offering uh, as a pilot for this first year. Um, so uh, it remains to be seen, I guess, how much encouragement uh, different departments want to give instructors, but we wanted to give people the option. Um, we know uh, some faculty are not comfortable with having so much information about AI in their courses, so we didn't want to make it uh, a mandate. Oh yeah, I see Tim's question. Uh, it's a great question. We talk about it all the time. I know I work with a ton of, I'm running a learning community right now with instructors uh, who are all talking about AI and that's like, that's one of the big questions people have. Um, I think the answer is yes. And I think it's one that it sounds like institutions and it sounds like our institution likely is trying to solve for that. And I think kind of the long-term solutions, which I'm not in charge of it, I don't know a ton about specifics, but it does seem like the long-term solutions involve things like institutional licenses, most likely to kind of even that playing field. But uh, but we do a lot of conversations. I know as some of the presentations I went to already, um, different teaching centers were talking about just like resources they share with instructors about what might be comparable tools and what's free versus not free. Uh, and so we do some of that too with our faculty. I'm seeing uh, Hannah's question uh, about whether we have any anecdotal data about levels of usage and whether faculty have any, had any feedback about the modules. Um, so uh, we can't see uh, live uh, usage within individual people's courses. However, we have had some anecdotal uh, data. A couple of faculty members have surveyed their students and shared uh, the survey responses with us about their experiences using the module. Um, and we have gotten some, uh, again, some of that anecdotal feedback uh, from faculty. Um, we had uh, some positive feedback from students is a range between some students who thought it was a review um, and but still found something valuable in the content uh, with uh, other students who all of this was totally new information to them. Um, so yeah, a range of student experiences. Um, yeah, but... I personally ran into, I I teach one small class that's unrelated to AI, uh, but through my role in the teaching center, and sometimes I use it to kind of grill my students about AI because I'm always curious about what they're thinking. And one time when I was doing that before class started, uh, one of the students was like, oh yeah, like we had a whole module in my class about AI. And um, and I learned that like, it's really interesting that the goal a lot of, of a lot of these things is to do kind of the next most likely word rather than the most accurate word. And I recognized that from the content that we did. And I was like, oh, that that was, I I helped make that module. So I think that was kind of the goal of the project too, was for it to feel just like it's part of the classes that it's in. Um, and so it was really cool hearing that, even though that was one student story. But yeah, like Ben mentioned, we have we have aspirations and plans to more for, formally survey folks. And then we have big plans to kind of use that survey both for thinking about small scale research and then also thinking about updates that we might do. lots of good comments. I think most people want to get their hands on the modules. <laughs> and you did say it's not just the university system. Um, you Other colleges could use those modules. Yes, yes. System. So the limiting factor is being in Canvas in order to really stick them in your courses. But the page that we linked has a view only version that anybody can look through what's there and, and see it and then the library guide too. Uh, and so we're, yes, we're very happy to share those. And, and you can just contact us too if you have issues with any of that. Yes. Ah, thank yeah. you, Ben, for putting that in there. Oh, of course. And uh, yeah, I think that's a great comment, Pavan. Uh, yeah, I, we've had also conversations about like, was Clippy AI, you know? Like, where are we drawing the line between some of these tools that already existed? and drawing uh, parallels between different types of systems. And that can be an interesting conversation for students as well. Oh, Clippy. <laughs> oh my. Are there any more questions? Because we're, we're just about at time. This has been extremely good presentation. Thank you. I want to uh, thank the presenters again. Um, the, the next and final session begins at 1240.